Paul's going to be, Paul, you probably already know if you're here, he's been doing RCU in the kernel for ages and was before that doing it for his PhD. Today he's going to talk about how it fits in with virtualization. So, Paul, over to you. So can RCU and CPU hot plugs survive the attack of the killer virtual environments? I think a legitimate question is, can anything survive the attack of the killer virtual environments? But um, given my focus, I'll stick with RCU and CPU hot plug for this talk. We'll go through a few, through a few things, look at a couple of uh, war stories I've had with uh, RCU and CPU hot plug and uh, virtualization, various combinations of them and then uh, at least get an interim answer to the question posed in the title. So why would CPU hot plug be a problem? How many people here have had uh, uh, fun, shall we say, with CPU hot plug? Yeah, we've had some people with fun with CPU hot plug. Yeah, it's, uh, it can be exciting. You know, if CPU hot plug could be atomic, it'd be really cool. You know, you just the CPU's there, the CPU's there, bam, the CPU's not there, and life would be great. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. It's kind of more like this. You know, it's all here, a little bit of it, it's kind of more gone, and, and uh, finally it's all gone after quite some time. You know, we're talking, in some cases, you know, milliseconds, tens of milliseconds. Sometimes I've seen a measure that's more than a second for the CPU to actually work through and get itself extracted from all of the things that the kernel's been expecting of it. In fact, uh, there's a nice little file, kernel slash CPU dot C. And if you look up in that file and search for any of these strings, there's these big arrays in current kernels. They had other ways of doing this in old kernels. And I'm not, this, this presentation is going to kind of be a skew of different versions, uh, just to keep people guessing. <laughs> but this is, uh, this is uh, current mainline. And as you can see, there's a bunch of steps it goes through. And it kind of is it, it, it uh, is it's coming online, it goes through the first list, then the second. If it's going offline, it goes up the second list and then up the first list, depending on exactly. And you can also, uh, with the current thing in theory, put a CPU partway offline and leave it there. Um, uh, th yeah, it's, uh, this does sound a little strange. <laughs> um, one of the reasons for that is to make testing easier. Uh, what can happen is if you have a particular piece of the kernel that, say, cares about uh, well, in my case, RCU slash tree prepare. I'm RCU, and so I could turn that one on and off really quickly and do a more stressful test of RCU's interaction with that piece of CPU hot plug. Of course, I'd also have to worry about RCU tree dying on the one side and RCU tree online. Uh, so for me, I'm kind of stuck. I got to do through most of the process anyway to get the full effect. But still, if you had a single point in there, you could, in theory, test your code much more quickly. Uh, and by the way, this is a partial list. I mean, this is all the array in that file, but it's also possible to kind of pop up as a module and say, hey, I wonder about CPU hot plug too. Um, and then you're an added step in there somewhere. But this is what's in the core kernel. Okay, so uh, CPU hot plug is unfortunately not an atomic operation. Um, it can extend over some period of time. It has a lot of moving parts in it. Um, and we kind of had a kind of, a, in my opinion, kind of a random approach to CPU plug, hot plug in the old days. Uh, one thing that's really nice is now is that we kind of go in one direction coming online and the other direction going offline. Can anybody tell me why that's a, well you've got the answer right up there, right? If you do that, you can kind of think of a CPU as offering a bunch of services and the services come and go in an organized fashion as opposed to uh, in the older days where uh, it was interesting uh, to at any point in time to figure out what the heck part of the CPU was working whether you count on it or not, and whether you need to pay attention to the fact it was there or not. Um, it's still interesting, by the way, but uh, uh, hopefully interesting in a more organized way. Okay, so what's the big deal with RC and CPU hot plug? Why should it care? This is kind of a cartoony high-level diagram of overall processing of an RCU grace period. And we're going to start in the left-hand side over there. And that's kind of the idle state. RCU kind of waits there to get a request for a new grace period. Hey, I've just removed something, I need to wait for all the readers to be gone, um, and it sends a request to RCU, and RCU will go through this loop on the other side. So the first thing it has to do when it's got a request is it has to initialize the grace period. It has to say, all right, we need response from these CPUs, we need to set things up so they'll be respond appropriately, we need to you know, go through the process and so on. And then we go through an inner loop 
Um, and this is, this all is very cartoony. Uh, the reality is always is a little more complicated. Um, you know, this is, this is your cool synchronization primitive. This is your cool synchronization primitive able to survive the Linux kernel, okay? <laughs> Any questions? So what we do is we wait a few jiffies, and then we have to check the idle CPUs. And why can't the idle CPUs let us know? Because, well, it, they could in theory. In practice, we make the kernel work that way. The guys doing battery power embedded are going to be very, very, very angry at you. Um, as in, not simply angry enough to flame you in LKML, but angry enough to call you on the phone and yell at you, all right? Uh, this really has happened to me once. <laughs> this is not a theoretical statement, this is, this is reality. <clears throat> so that means that we have to check the idle CPUs externally. We can't rely on them, to, we have to leave them alone. They need to stay low power for the battery powered guys. And then we say, well, is the grace period done now? And if it's not, we loop around and keep doing that. And finally, when all the CPUs have either shown up idle or otherwise announced that there's no possibility of old readers running on that CPU anymore, we clean up after the grace period and wait for the next one. If you have a server class kernel, if you're running a server workload, um, RCU never really stops. Uh, by the time it gets done with one grace period, there's something for it in the next grace period in normal workloads. If you're running embedded, it can stay in that uh, left-hand side for a very long time. Uh, some of the embedded systems are extremely quiet, and just nothing will happen for a long time, then something they need to pay attention to, and they wake up and do stuff. But that's kind of a high-level thing, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit deeper look at a few of these things in order to uh, uh, see some of the excitement uh, that's ensued at various times between RCU and CPU hot plug. We're going to focus on wait a few jiffies. I mean, waiting a few jiffies, I mean, you wait a few jiffies, what's the big deal, right? Well, even if you're not battery empowered embedded, if you wait a few jiffies for, by spinning, just having the CPU spin, waiting for a few tens of milliseconds maybe, uh, people are gonna get angry at you, and not just the battery powered guys. So we don't do that. Instead, we do this. So this is, this, these four boxes are just an expansion of that green box on the previous slide. We'll go back. So that green box is those four boxes. So what we do is we post a timer on the timer wheel. We could use HR timers, but we don't, all right? Um, for one thing, RC doesn't care that much about exactly when it gets woken up, as long as it does. So this is a job for the timer wheels, not so much for HR timers. And in the fullness of time, uh, the timer system says, oh, look, enough time's passed. We're going to raise soft IRQ, and it's going to invoke the timer handler. And that timer handler, because it's my timer handler, says, okay, wake up and go take another pass to that inner loop. Okay, no big deal, right? Um, of course, except that we got CPU hot plug. And so it could be that we posted the timer on CPU 5's timer wheel. And then shortly afterwards, CPU 5 might have gone offline. But that's not a big deal because what will happen is at some point in the hot plug operation, the CPU offline operation, that timer is going to get migrated to some surviving CPU. And then later on, on that surviving CPU, we go through the same thing again, spray soft IRQ, you run the timer handler, and the timer handler says wake up and life is good. Yes, I don't know if you heard the but back in the audience, but yes, I think you pretty much understand the drill if you've seen one or two of my talks, all right? <laughs> yeah, but. Um, there are hot plug notifiers that wait for grace periods sometimes. <laughs> and uh, by the laughs, I'm pretty sure some, some of you have anticipated the next few slides, but I'll go through them anyway, just for effect. Um, yeah, uh, that can be a problem. And the reason it can be a problem is that RC is waiting on a timer. Okay, yeah, yeah well, RC is waiting on a timer, that, that, we're good with that. And that timer is waiting on hot plug. Except that hot plug's waiting on RCU. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of a deadlock cycle. Uh, if you aren't, let me assure you that uh, deadlocks can have bad effects on both your response time and your throughput. 
<laughs> and it's your life, do what you want. My advice would be to try to avoid them. Okay, so we got this deadlock. This is a bad thing. This really happened. And uh, we had a, uh, an interesting resolution to it. This is a comment taken out of the code. I'll read it to you. On the teardown path, timer's dead CPU must be invoked before blkmqq reinit notify. I'll say that three times really fast. Let's do it. blkmqq reinit notify. Uh, I'll stop there. That was good enough. Uh, from notify dead, otherwise an RCU stall occurs. And then that's exactly why we were having a problem there. It doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. And um, in that case, we have, again, severe degradation of both response time and throughput. Lately, I made a change where I do the migration much early in the process. And in theory, that would make that constraint unnecessary. In practice, I haven't had the guts to test it yet. <laughs> but someday maybe I'll feel brave and try it. Okay, well, now we've seen a case where RCU and CPU hot plug and timers, I suppose, had a, a fun time together. Why would virtualization be a problem? I mean, we've been doing virtualization for a very long time. People were doing virtualization on mainframes before I was in high school. And you might note from my hair color that might have been a while back, all right? And it was. All right, so we've got a different, this is a different pro. This is taking the hot, the, I didn't try to make a diagram of the entire CPU hot plug thing uh, because it's pretty complicated and weird. But I took a very cartoony part of the very last part of the process. So before that first box, we've gone through a whole bunch of notifiers. And everybody said, yeah, it's OK for that CPU to go away. We've removed all its, uh, all its tasks. And we go and we do a stop machine, which means it's running on a very special task with interrupts disabled. And at that point, it says, hey, you know something? I'm gone. I'm out of here. And uh, it does that by clearing it a bit in CPU online mask. CPU online mask being a, a CPU mask, a bunch of bits, one for each CPU on the system. Um, and it's done that in this little stop machine task. And then it's going to do a context switch. And it's going to go one last time through the scheduler. It's going to hit the idle loop because all the other tasks for it to run are gone. So there's nothing else for it to do. And in the idle loop, there's a special check saying, hey, am I supposed to be offline? And if the answer is yes, it kind of shunts it aside into Arch-specific code that actually turns the CPU off or does whatever the architecture wants. But in some cases, they really do power the CPU down one piece at a time and shut it off. The battery-powered guys like that approach, for example. OK, and that point, CPU is offline. No problem, right? Yeah, yeah, I know, but. Yeah, well, you know, the scheduler uses RCU. And that means that RCU needs to be watching the CPU, paying attention to it, while it takes that last pass for the scheduler. But if. RCU is looking at that CPU offline online mask bit. It's not paying attention. Um, and that would mean that if some of the data structures that the scheduler is traversing were being modified during that time, the scheduler might find itself suddenly traversing the free list. And that can greatly shorten the uptime of your kernel and of much else besides. OK. On the other hand, we've got another but. This is a good but, all right? You can quote me on that, although I wouldn't recommend it. Interrupts are disabled, all right? This thing has, when it went into that stop machine, it disabled interrupts, and they're never coming back on again. So we can't be interrupted. And, there's no, and I said before, there's nothing runnable on the CPU. We can't be preempted. There's nothing else for it to do. It's just going to go straight to the idle loop and be gone. And that's only a few microseconds. Just a handful of microseconds. It can be longer on embedded CPUs, but that's OK, because they run with a slower hertz value. So what we can do is we can just supply an extra jiffy of grace. In other words, when we're waiting for grace period, and we've got a CPU that is now offline, we say, well, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to trust that until a jiffy passes. Once we, if we've seen it offline, a jiffy later, we'll, we'll believe it's offline. This 
happy hack isn't quite as happy as you might like on hypervisors, because that can happen. We can be in the scheduler, and we've got interrupts off. We can't be preempted. There's nothing else for us to do. Well, there's nothing for the guest OS to do, but the underlying KVM or whatever you're running down there might decide that this vCPU has had enough time, thank you, out of the pool, we're running another one. And meanwhile, there are other vCPUs that may be updating the time. And so we can be preempted for one good long time. Uh, in particular, we can be preempted for a lot longer than a Jiffy. And that means supplying an extra Jiffy of grace isn't guaranteed to get us out of this trouble. You know the really horrible thing about this? Anyone want to guess what the really horrible thing about this is? You know, RCU's been... <laughs> you know, I put that in there, I knew I was going to have to fix it at some point. And I was pretty sure somebody was going to whack me over the head with it, and it just never happened. And finally it's like, you know, if this has been 10 years, I need to fix this, right? It wasn't like anybody reported a problem. But, you know... But, you know, so you can ask yourself, is this a real problem? And the thing is that, well, it hasn't been in the past, except that, you know, people used to be really dainty about, about uh, their virtual workloads. You know, they were going from a place where they had some uh, system running at like 1% utilization because you had this thing where you could only have one application per, per uh, OS. And then they virtualized and got it up to maybe 30%. And if you've only got 30% utilization, why would you go around preempting some guy that's doing useful work when you've got a whole pile of idle CPUs around? But vCPU preemption really can and does happen. I make it happen in RCU torture, okay? Um, and uh, there are people, especially some of the cloud computing providers that I've run into occasionally, that run with overcommitted CPUs if you're running at 100% CPU utilization, you know, preemption is a matter, you know, just the way things work, right? That's just what's, that's going to happen. And so it'd be good to have a solution. Uh, as usual, there's a number of non-solutions. We could increase the number of jiffies of grace, but if you're running KVM, somebody could go kill dash stop on your vCPU and leave it that way for a long time. Uh, uh, and uh, people are rumored to single step these things and run under GDB, which would also have a similar effect. I've never managed to make that work myself. Uh, I've never been motivated to because my bugs tend to be weird race conditions that you know, single step, forget it, you're never going to see it that way. Uh, we could delay the grace period until the end of the CPU hot plug operation, right? Except that uh, that would end up with our, back with our deadlock we saw earlier, uh, where we were waiting for a grace period to finish the CPU hot plug operation. Uh, in theory, we could detect the problem after the fact and fix it, uh, but, uh, well, let's just say if you figure out a way to fix random memory corruption, you know, I'd like to hear about it, that'd be really cool, but you should expect me to be quite skeptical as you're entering that conversation, all right? Random memory corruption is great stuff. Uh, try to avoid it. Okay, so what we do, is we make it just ignore the CPU online mask. What we're doing here is we're going to keep two sets of books. They tell me that it's not a good thing to do for tax purposes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll let you make that decision on your own. <clears throat> as far as I know, uh, none of the relevant tax authorities care about RCU. At least they haven't told me about it yet. So I'm going to keep two sets of books. And that means, you know, uh, it's going to clear the online mask, and RCU is going to say, yeah, whatever, uh, I'm going to ignore you. We're going to go through this last context switch, and uh, the scheduler is going to use RCU, but RCU is still paying attention to it, because it's ignoring the CPU online mask. And when we hit the idle loop, just at the end, we're going to have a, we have a special function call right in the idle loop, calling out to RCU, saying, this CPU is gone. And at that point, uh, RCU keeps its own set of masks, and things work well. Yeah, I know, Q, but... 
Okay, so uh, you could have you could you could last for a long time. You preempted for a long time and be great. So that's wonderful because RCU is still paying a pension until it gets informed. And once it gets informed, you're just not supposed to use RCU beyond that point. And if you do, and somebody runs test your stuff with config prove RCU, otherwise known as config prove locking, uh, which does various deadlock checks, uh, it's going to yell at you. Um, it currently yells at ARMv7 unconditionally. Um, Russell and I seem to not be able to come to agreement on how to fix it, but uh, we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> so at least I know it works. So there's an issue here. Uh, we're going to show some diagrams of why this is an issue. But the thing is, is that when RCU is doing its grace period initialization, it needs a consistent snapshot of who's there and who's not throughout the process. And we'll look at the data structure and see why that is. But there's a couple tricks. One of them is that if a CPU pops up in the middle of a grace period, that CPU can still be ignored. Okay? The thing is that we only care about CPUs that were there before the grace period started because those are the only ones that are able to access data that might be exposed to readers that we're waiting for. So we might have a list, we might have removed an item, and there are readers that might still be looking at that item. But if a CPU comes online later, it has no way to get to that item, so it's not a problem. We can ignore them. So if a CPU pops up in the middle of a grace period, we can still ignore it. If a, our, if a CPU disappears during a grace period, we see it going away. And furthermore, there are extra checks in various places to, to detect. There's some races that can happen. There's various uh, checks to notice that and to get rid of it. So we don't have to make our initialization anticipate which CPUs are going to come and go. We can just take a snapshot as of that time, and it's good. OK. And this is the data structure. It's a tree. Uh, each CPU has a, 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 one of these white RCU data structures. Uh, here we're being ambitious and going for 4,096 CPUs. And there's a tree that combines them. <clears throat> By default, the leaf nodes of that tree take 16 CPUs each. And we just go up levels until we get to a root. Okay? And the way this works, each node, each of those pink RCU node trees, has a view of all the CPUs in the subtree underneath it. So this lower left one sees CPU 0 through 15. And the lower right one sees CPU 4080 through 4095. An intermediate level would just see the subtree. And uh, what happens is the initialization for the next grace period starts at the root and goes breadth first. So you know why not? Uh, and, and what we do um, on the left-hand side, there's QS mask. And we'll, we'll review this in another slide. But what that does, that's the, each bit set in there is a CPU we haven't heard from yet that we need to hear from before we can say, yeah, that CPU is done. It's not got any more readers, so we can just ignore it from now on out, at least for the rest of the grace period. And QS mask init, that is the CPUs that are online, OK? Or were online at the beginning of the grace period. All right, so if we pick any particular node in the tree, so if we get, we're in the middle of the tree somewhere, the top, the bottom, somewhere, we've got this RCU node structure. Its QS mask is saying for each bit of that QS mask, the child of that node has at least one CPU that still needs to check in. All right, and if we're at the bottom level, that child is just one CPU. If we're further up the tree, that child is a set of CPUs feeding up to that subtree. And that's initialized by the grace period K thread at the beginning of the grace period. So it goes through and it uh, sets that up. Then that's the thing that happens from the root breadth first. QS mask init is the value that we want to set QS, mis QS mask to at the grace period start. And it's exactly the same as CPU online mask in the old days. It's just copied out to make the grace period initialization happen faster. The theory here being that we do a lot more grace period initializations than CPU hot plugs, which is true in most cases except for RCU torture. <clears throat> so that's set and cleared by CPU hot plug. So you can imagine 
we might have a case where we're initializing the tree and at the same time, going down from top to bottom, at the same time a CPU hot plug operation might come up from the bottom saying a CPU is here or not. Okay, and what it does is it sets, a, if coming online you set a bit in the leaf node, and if you're the first CPU in that leaf node, then you go up to the next node and set the bit and keep going until there's somebody else there already, until you're not the only subtree for that node. And uh, one thing that could happen, you could be traversing down and you could hit that node in the, the red node and you say, this guy needs a quiescent state. All right? He's got a bit in his QS mask in it, so we're going to set that bit in his QS mask. We're going to just copy that mask over and he needs a quiescent state. In the meantime, we'd have a CPU hot plug coming up from the bottom to that child node, the green one, and the CPU could be coming online. It could therefore say, excuse me, going offline. I'll get it right sooner or later. So the CPU is going offline. It clears the bit and says, you know, we're the, last, we're the last CPU on the subtree. We don't need a quiescent state for the subtree anymore. And we could go into the grace period in this state with the upper guy saying, we need a quiescent state from the green node. And the green node saying, I don't need to provide a quiescent state. And if you do that, uh, which I have done a few times, you get a grace period hang. Because there's no off online CPU below that, there's not going to be a quiescent state. And even if there was a quiescent state, it'd look and say, oh, all my bits are clear, so I, we're good. And therefore, we'll never clear the bit in the guy up there. And therefore, the grace period will never end. Now, that's the way it worked in the old days, except in the old days, we didn't allow waiting for grace periods and hot plug notifiers. So what we did was we just blocked CPU hot plug during grace period initialization. And that was all fun and well until somebody needed to wait for a grace period in CPU hot plug notifiers. But that's, this is how it worked. That's how we avoided this problem. Because we just made sure there wasn't anything coming up from the bottom while we were doing our initialization and life was good. And you have the opposite problem. This is the case. I got confused earlier. This is when the CPU is coming online. We don't need anything. For instance, we're coming down the top. The, the QS mask init is all zeros. So we put all zeros in QS mask. Don't need anything from the subtree. And uh, about that time, the guy comes up and says, hey, we need something here. Um, what happens in that case is the grace period can end early. And uh, that's a really bad idea. Uh, some of the CPUs down there might still be messing with the data structure. You free it. Um, and again, this is not good for the actuarial statistics of your kernel. Okay, so this is where we come up with our second set of books. That's, uh, we, we have the same slide we had earlier with QS mask, QS mask, init, init. And we have an init next. And the init next is what's messed with by the CPU hot plug. It sets and clears bits there. And then in initialization, we do what we did before, except that as a, we take a first pass through the leaves of the tree, and we copy. If we see a difference between QS mask init and QS mask init next, we'll copy them over, holding a lock, and propagate the change up the tree. Once we've done that, QS mask is constant. It will not change. We have all the CPU hot plugs we want. It'll just change the mask next. And so, once we've done that first pass, we're guaranteed those two things will be consistent, and we won't have those funny mismatches in the tree, thus avoiding at least one class of possible two short grace periods and grace period hangs. Uh, there's some other benefits of doing it this way. Uh, we don't have to block CPU hot plug and grace period setup, which avoids deadlocks when people call synchronized RCU from their hot plug notifiers. Uh, same thing with expedited grace periods, it turns out, uh, which means it's now okay to wait for them. Uh, unfortunately, I have not propagated this sort of change to RCU barrier, so please don't use RCU barrier and CPU hot plug notifiers for the moment. Uh, it's on my list to fix this. Uh, I think I came up with a way of fixing it earlier this week. On the other hand, I've had that experience several times before, so I would take that with a grain of salt. It might actually, this might actually work, but uh, it takes a little bit to prove it. Okay, so some more fun with RCU and virtualization. Here we got a read side critical section. We see RCU read lock, start reading. We pick up a pointer. We've got a local copy of it. It's an RCU protected pointer. 
We indirect the pointer, pick up field A, and we feed it to a function. We say rcu unlock. And if that function is fairly fast, this is a nice short rcu critical section. Works great, won't block the grace periods, life is wonderful. Unless the hypervisor decides that vCPU just doesn't need any CPU time in the middle of the RCU read side critical section. And this can persist for a very long time. I haven't heard reports of it. Uh, it's something I've been looking for for a while. Um, a guy named Aravinda Prasad um, and, uh, is, uh, took a look at that. Uh, there's a Usenix uh, paper last year published on it. Um, and this isn't necessarily subtle. If you have 2x overcommit, you can get a 50% increase in your peak memory utilization. Okay. Now, uh, having a 2x overcommit is a bit brave today. I think that there might be other parts of the Linux stack that might have problems with that. But um, I kind of like RCU not to be the short straw or the long straw in that uh, stack. Uh, plus, you know, you look at the cloud computing economics, and I don't see any reason why people won't just keep increasing the utilization until something breaks, and then they'll scream and then increase it some more. Uh, so, you know, so this seems to be human nature. This is not just cloud computing. I'm sorry. Oh, this, this worked? Okay, let's do some more. Let's, hey, how come it broke suddenly? So a solution would be a good thing. And uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, uh, we've got kind of a patch that messes with this, whether it actually is helpful long-term or not. It's an interesting question I don't know the answer to. But the thing is, we have this RCU CPU stall warning code. And if you do something like this, the stall warning code will notice. And at that point, you could, in theory, tell the hypervisor, you know, this vCPU really could use some time. How about you help it out? Um, that isn't exactly theoretically appealing, but um, it's what we've thought of so far. And uh, we got some experiments ongoing, and hopefully we'll have something positive to report at a later date. So the question of this talk, can all this survive killer environments? Well, you, we certainly can't ignore it. Um, we've already had RCU changes motivated by the fact that this vCPU preemption can happen, and there's probably going to be some more. Uh, and what's, what's happening is that the problems the user mode guys have had to deal with forever are now making their way into the kernel. User mode code can be preempted at any time for any reason. There's no way to stop it. And if you're in a guest OS, guess what? You can turn the interrupts all, off all you want. You can be an NMI handler. It doesn't matter. You can be preempted. Okay? So we're not being forced to do anything that the user mode guys haven't had to deal with for a long time. So I guess we really can't complain too much. But um, uh, we've got a kind of a scorecard. We've got a few fixes in there. Uh, the last thing I talked about is still work in progress. We think we have a way to at least make it work better. Um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, long-term outlook, uh, long-term being more than a few minutes, I guess. Uh, things look good. It looks, you know, again, the user mode guys have dealt with this for a long time. We should be able to, too. But I think there's a lot more work needed. And uh, if you have kernel code, I would encourage you to check it and see if you've got vulnerabilities of this sort. It's just so easy. I've got interrupts disabled, therefore it can't take very long, you know? Uh, no, it can take as long as it wants. <clears throat> and you, know, you don't even need a hypervisor. All you need is an ECC event in your cache, right? Or any number of other things, an, uh, an SMI if you're on x86 and equivalent things on other CPUs. So um, in any case, uh, RCU continues to spare me uh, the penalty of boredom, so I guess that's a good thing. I might get in trouble otherwise. And uh, this slide, as always, is sponsored by Admin Legal. And I think we've got time for a few questions, if people have them. Um, if we get the guy a microphone, if we don't quickly, I can yell it out for him. Questions, so uh, one there first. Oh, sorry. Thank you for your talk. Uh, two quick questions. One was in about slide 51 or so, you said there was this hypervisor hint. How do you actually send that? So we're um, looking at slide 50, that one, right? Uh, yeah, how do you actually send that hypervisor hint <coughs> to the hypervisor? Uh, what I do is I say, I tell Aravinda, you know, if you give me a hypervisor call and uh, a Linux kernel thing wrapping around it, I'll, I'll invoke it when I feel it's needed. So that's, that's the way I solve it. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, he's, he's been experimenting with uh, power, but I can't imagine, uh, it's, he's using a KVM uh, approach, so I would imagine that it would you know, work no worse on other architectures than PowerPC. Okay, and uh, inside the, I've been doing a lot of stuff with rapid hot plug and hot unplug, and inside the machine, I'm wondering if there's a way to actually receive an event other than just polling for it when a CPU is added or removed. Um, so without tailing dmessage or without like something like I notify, but for knowing that a CPU change happened. So you're asking if user mode can pull for, can be informed when a CPU pops up or goes away. That's right. I don't know of such a thing. Um, I have no idea whether I notify works on uh, slash proc, and I'm hearing seeing somebody shake their head no rather violently in front, so I'll, <laughs> I'll bow yeah. to their expertise. Um, yeah, so select, somebody says. Uh, why, don't you, why, don't you, uh, why don't we get a microphone to the guy, and maybe he can tell him more. If, you, if there isn't a way, I would sincerely love to have that. Thank you. So what, what, what was select? Uh, OK, let's get a microphone yeah. to him, and he can. Where is he? Where is he? Oh, sorry. Yeah, of course. You can just pull the files. <laughs> yeah, use ePoll on it. Yeah, at, at least with SysFS as well, you can't use iNotify or denotify, but you can uh, open the file descriptor and just select on it and wait for changes that way, which is bizarre and completely undocumented. Hey, we got, we've got yeah. another uh, uh, riff on that uh, over there. If we can actually go back to questions, it might be a good idea. But, uh, I actually had a question. Um, but th that being said, it makes sense probably to provide the U event. Uh, we should probably uh, um, propose that on the mailing list. So okay. I had a question. Um, how much of, of the work that happens during the tearing down of a CPU needs active help from the CPU that's about to die? And, and the reason I'm asking that is, wouldn't it be nice if we could support surprise unplug? As in, this CPU just died. It was in user space, so we can just kill that process. Or in some circumstances on some high-end machine, we have the RAS capabilities allowing us to extract the state out of the CPU, which will allow us to sort of revive the task elsewhere without actually killing it. Uh, so uh, I know we are getting better. And could we do, is it imaginable that in some future time we could uh, support no active participation of the dying CPU in the process. So, so um, can we have CPU hot plug with the CPU that just fail stops? Uh, the mainframe guys do that, but they, they have uh, an incredible amount of hardware and firmware support to make that happen. There are some cases where I would see that as being very challenging. If, uh, if you're in the kernel holding a spin lock and you fail stop, um, Oh, in user space. So we, we're, we're in user space and this happens. Um, the user space task would have changed the registers. I, I think you have the same sort of problem. Um, now, there are applications that can deal with that. Um, but what they, they do some odd things with uh, program constraints. So what they do is they treat their in memory as if it was a database. And they essentially have transaction, you know, software transactions to commit. So that some of the database uh, guys do that. Okay, so we're going to kill the process. We're going to kill dash nine the thing. Okay, and okay, so so basically we uh, we've killed dash nine it, or we've done the moral equivalent of that. And can the thing just disappear and have have everybody be okay? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. The, the way that the hot plug code is structured right now, um, it would hang pretty badly before it got even close. Um, I, I, it's just software in principle we could. Uh, whether, whether it would be worth the effort is an interesting question I don't have an opinion on right now. Um, but something to maybe talk about. We have another question here. Would it be possible to ask the hypervisor for some sort of service level agreement? So, like, you know, unless you give me n microseconds a second, things are going to go badly. A serverless level agreement with the hypervisor. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, that's, that may be a long-term solution. I think, it, I think there's, uh, 
my guess is there's a fair number of PhD dissertations between now and then, or, or a fair amount of people hacking various things. Um, uh, you could imagine telling the hypervisor, I'm in a place now where I need help, uh, where, uh, yeah, but I think we would have the same issues uh, that we, with that that we've ha traditionally had in the Linux kernel with uh, implementing some of the things where, hey, I, I can't be preempted even though I'm in user mode, right? Uh, so I would expect um, a solution like that to be examined very closely <laughs> and uh, perhaps uh, hostilely. Um, there are real-time uh, deadline scheduler sorts of things. So if the underlying OS is the Linux kernel, you could potentially uh, say this, is, this vCPU is, is going to be run by the deadline scheduler. I need this much every so often. And uh, well, give or take the relative immaturity of the deadline scheduler, that should just work. So <laughs> you, you've had some experience, you say, Peter. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, uh, but as that matures, that might be, the, so maybe we can use existing things. But I think that uh, Willie might have some a perspective on that. Yeah, as, as the owner of the hypervisor that is running your kernel, I really don't care what your bronze service level agreement is. The platinum guy gets, pro gets priority, and you, you, can, you can emit all the RCU store warnings you want. You only paid for a bronze service, and that's all you're getting. <laughs> so uh, if you've got bronze service, you're, you're, it's too bad. You're stuck. So the answer was yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions here? Oh, yeah, we so, have one uh, I'm going I'm to ask a question of Willie here, but I'm sorry to. Uh, okay, go ahead. So uh, one approach you could take on that is if it's uh, if the, if I if I give you the hint saying, hey, this guy needs stuff, you can say, well, you're bronze, we're shutting you down entirely, which would prevent any time. <laughs> now you'd uh, yeah, be, would be it'd be interesting because time would pass, and when you let me go again, I might immediately stall warning at that point. But maybe that's something that could be uh, handled. Uh, time in a virtual environment is another separate problem. Uh, yes. <laughs> Time is a problem, whether virtual or not. Uh, a comment, may, comment more than a question, maybe. But, uh, the, the bug you fixed with this uh, you know, extra GFI we were waiting that could just turn into something way too long uh, well, isn't fundamentally just a problem with virtualization. I mean, there are cases where your BIOS is going to take away your CPU for some obscure reason uh, for a millisecond at a time. Uh, there are cases where your very high-end CPU decide that uh, some uh, hardware uh, lock, lock up prevention mechanism and recovery me mechanism kicks in mm -hmm. and, uh, and your CPU goes away for a millisecond. So fundamentally, you fixed a bug uh, that wasn't specific, I think, to virtualization. Um, I agree. Um, uh, the, there's any number of ways you can make this happen, um, but a lot of the ways you mentioned are things that are unusual uh, and also bad for other reasons. I mean, if you, if you grab a CPU by the throat and shake it for a while, uh, the real-time guys aren't going to be very happy with that system, although that doesn't necessarily stop CPU vendors from doing it anyway, or, or system vendors more generally from doing that anyway. Um, but you're right. It, this, this does... Um, help more things than just virtual. You know, I think the reason I got away with this for so long is two things. One, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the virtualized environments tended to run very low CPU utiliza utilization, so preemption was unusual. Second, CPU hot plug is unusual. Very rarely happens in production. And third, the things you mentioned, um, SMI handlers and NMIs and other things like that are also rare events. And so, you know, we may have a thing where we had a vulnerability, but it was kind of a geologic time sort of a thing. But still, it's good to fix it because uh, having RCU do bad things is really, really hard to debug. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. That's the time for the last question. Uh, the organizers have given a small gift for, for Paul. Thank you very uh, much. Let's just give him another round of applause. And, and thank, you, thank you all very much for your time and attention. <laughs>